nice new podium. It's, it's mic is great. I'm Bill Bryan. I'm a board member here at the Feathers Press Club, and um, it's time to get started. I hope everybody is ready for a, a very Merry Christmas and uh, Sensational 17. So uh, before we get started, let me just remind everybody that uh, only members of Batters Press Club and the Working Press are allowed to ask questions. And we'd like for you to ask them in the form of a question without a diatribe or your own narrative preceding the question. And also, too, Kimberly, if you can remember when they ask you the questions, if you can repeat the question, just so the people in the back of the room can hear what the question is. But our speaker today is Kimberly Lewis Robinson, and she is the, um, the Secretary of the Department of Revenue, or uh, Governor John Bill Edwards. And prior to her current position, she served as partner in the Tax and Estate Practice Group with Jones Walker. And there, she primarily practiced uh, state and local tax matters, including tax and business planning, tax incentives, appeals, audits, tax litigation and appeal, tax controversies, and state and local tax statutes. So she knows her taxes. Uh, her practice also includes area of economic development, financing, incentives, and government relations. And before joining Jones Walker, she served as special counsel for the uh, Office of the Governor uh, where she worked as legal counsel for Kathleen Blanco. And during her tenure with the governor, she served as a liaison to the Department of Revenue and Economic Development, and served as senior policy advisor on economic development, insurance, and uh, revenue policy. She also worked for six years at the Department of Revenue, serving as assistant secretary for the Office of Legal Affairs and confidential assistant to the secretary. And from 1998 to 2000, she served as a judicial clerk to the Honorable Justice Burnett Johnson, who is now the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So, welcome Kimberly Robinson. that does not produce sufficient revenues to fund state services. 
with those principles in mind, we set about developing a tax structure that is both broad-based and has low rates. The broader the base, the more fair the system is perceived to be. Everyone is paying. And the lower the rates, the more progressive in nature and less regressive in nature that tax system is. When we started our work, we looked at both spending recommendations and revenue enhancements. From the spending side, we wanted to make sure that the state focused its attention on dedications. Louisiana has more than 500 dedications in number that's both constitutional and statutory. And it's very important that the current legislature look at those dedications, um, as well as the division and the governor, and make a determination whether all of those are still spending priorities for the state. Things that may have been dedicated in 1978 may not be as much a priority as when it was dedicated in 1978. We may have grown beyond that. We may not even have that industry or that need anymore. So we are recommending that the legislature take a serious look at the dedications with an eye towards those things that can be eliminated, but recognizing that eliminating dedications does not in and of itself free up money in the budget. A lot of those dedications are to areas that someone has found to be important. Some of them are fees for service. Those fees and those services will continue to need to be performed. They don't just go away because you eliminate the statutory dedication to it. Some of those dedications, like the Minimum Foundation Program, which is by far one of the largest in the Constitution, well, that funds K-12 education. We're not going to walk away from funding K-12 ed education, so eliminating that in the Constitution would not have the same effect. The same with the Transportation Trust Fund, which we also know that we need infrastructure very badly in this state. And that's another task force that has been meeting and will be issuing their report in January on transportation infrastructure funding. <clears throat> in order to make this process easier, we're recommending staggered sunsets on some of these dedications so that they do come up for review on a regular basis. And once you review them once, you don't just leave them there and forget about them. We want to make sure that spending is focused on areas that we have identified, but that we're spending recurring revenue on recurring expenditures, and that we're leaving the non-recurring revenue to those areas that are set forth in the Constitution. When you're recurring and non-recurring revenue get out of whack, you end up with major deficits, and you end up with the nece necessary budget cuts that we've been living through for the last nine years now. We also are recommending that we not focus on short-term revenue gains that will have long-term consequences. One of the most important being the UAL, or unfunded accrued liability. Now we could refinance that debt and stretch it out further, but it's going to cost us more money. We are currently on the path to pay down that UAL, and that is something that we need to continue doing in the way that we're doing it. And we also need to focus on ensuring that we don't create any future unfunded approved liabilities. <clears throat> Recognizing that the state has focused its efforts on streamlining and efficiencies, we recommend that that continue, that not only have we had recommendations from prior years, 2010 and 2014, but in 2016, the legislature enacted House Concurrent Resolution 25, and asked all agencies to identify ways that they could further improve their efficiencies. We think that's a good exercise and it should continue. We also are mindful that this is not a silver bullet. There's not an efficiency that can be created that will automatically help us with a $300 million or $600 million deficit. It is efficiencies that over time will cause savings, but they are not immediate savings to the state fisc. <clears throat> now on to the revenue side. What we recommended is based upon our existing structure. In 2016, when we made changes to the sales tax, we made the state very reliant on sales tax revenues. So from a just overall budget perspective, the sales tax revenues are projected to be 36% of our total spending. Whereas the next closest category is income tax or individual income tax, which is predicted to be 25%. 
the task force is recommending that those two major components of spending be equalized so that you're closer to having 33% from sales tax, 33% from individual income tax, and the remaining third of the budget coming from other areas, including the excise taxes, the severance taxes, mineral revenues, and the premium taxes. So one, in doing so, you balance out your reliance on one revenue source versus the other. Most um, people that tell you anything about an overall tax structure is to have a balance or three legs to your revenue stool so that you're not with one leg that's far greater than anything else in your stool is never balanced. So three legs is what we're recommending, income, sales, and the other leg made up of the miscellaneous taxes. The other piece of that is that if you have income tax and sales tax both equal, they balance out the regressive nature of the sales tax, and they make the income tax, which is a more progressive tax, spread farther across the border for both individuals who are at the lower end of the economic spectrum as well as the high end. From an income tax specific recommendation, we are looking at the federal income tax deduction. Now this was the same deduction that was up for corporate income tax on the November 8th ballot, and we heard from the voters that they were not in favor of removing that deduction. But we also recognize that most voters didn't get any information beyond the reports that were put out by maybe Carr and Cable explaining the amendments. We need to do a better job of educating the public on what the federal income tax deduction is, the impact it has on state tax collections, as well as the impact it has on their state tax payment. If your federal income tax decreases, you're going to pay more in state tax because you have a smaller deduction. So we need to explain that, and we also need to explain that by eliminating that major deduction, you are making the base so much broader that you are in a position to lower rates. And that is the other side of our recommendation, to lower our current 2%, 4%, and 6% rates by 25%. And then with those changes, we will still generate the revenue necessary to fund state government, but everyone will get to enjoy a tax break of some sort. In the event that the federal income tax deduction does not come up for a vote by the voters again, what we are recommending is further changes to the income tax, but on the excess itemized deduction side and a compression of the brackets. This sounds like what we had in place prior to changes that were made in 2007 and 2008 with the excess itemized deductions going away and the brackets being compressed. We think this is a good exchange or trade-off in the event federal income tax deductibility stays in the Constitution. Other changes that we're recommending include establishing sunset dates for certain tax credits, deductions and exemptions on the income tax side, but also continuing our investment in some of the exemptions and credits that spur early childhood development. Those were enacted in 2005, six, and seven, and we think those are good programs that we should continue to invest in. <clears throat> On the sales tax side, we are recommending broadening the sales tax base by eliminating certain exemptions, specifically those exemptions that were eliminated from the clean penny when it was enacted during the first special session. We're also recommending doing away with that clean penny. We need to go back to a 4% rate as opposed to the current 5% rate. Louisiana sales tax rate is at this point, when you look at certain local governments, we have the highest sales tax in the country. That's not good for our citizens, nor is it good from an economic development standpoint. So we need to be able to move back to the 4% rate. We also need to expand our sales tax base to tax services. That is the fastest growing sector of our economy, and we need to look at our sales tax laws, which were for the most part enacted in the 1940s, catching up with today's economy and taxing the way that people consume things and the way that businesses do business. When I was a child, we went to the library or we went to the bookstore to buy books. We didn't go on our laptops or our phones or our iPads to buy books. We actually had to go somewhere physically, pick up an item, it didn't get delivered 
electronically in just a matter of seconds. I remember the first time I, the first Kindle I received as a gift, it told me it had whisper technology and I was thinking, well, what does that do? And so I went to the bookstore, I found a book I wanted, and within 10 seconds, that book was on my Kindle and I was like, whoa, this whisper technology is impressive. But our sales tax laws don't necessarily re recognize whisper technology. They're still looking at something tangible that you receive. So we need to move our sales tax laws into the 21st century. And that's one of the recommendations of the task force. Um, beyond reducing the sales tax from five to four percent, I think that is the most important recommendation that we're making. The other things in terms of the services, there's a list of those services available on the task force website, which is maintained by the Department of Revenue. So you can look at those services and get a sense of which services we're expanding to. I often get questions from my fellow lawyers and the CPAs about whether we're taxing them, but I assure them that taxing professional services is not where we're headed, but we are looking at taxing the other services that people consume on a daily basis. The other part of our sales tax that is very important is the issue of uniformity. Right now, there are three different bills or proposals pending in Congress. I don't think any of them will get moved before this Congress adjourns, but we expect that in the new Congress, they'll be introduced again. These all come from what we call the Marketplace Fairness Act. When you buy online from Amazon or Overstock, they have not been collecting sales tax for most of the states that they're in. But if you go to a bricks and mortar store, you're going to pay sales tax. That Marketplace Fairness Act has been introduced over the last several Congresses, but we're finally making progress towards Marketplace Fairness becoming a reality. For Louisiana, it won't matter unless we do something about uniform administration and a uniform base. So that's the other key to the task force recommendations. Uniformity, the same things need to be taxable at the state and local level. Right now, to figure out if something is taxed at the state level or the local level, some businesses maintain a spreadsheet just so they know when they buy this particular item, if they should have paid sales tax or accrued use tax, and whether it was the same in every parish or in certain parishes. It shouldn't be that complicated for taxpayers to comply with the system. The other thing that's required by the Marketplace Fairness Act is a single collector. Louisiana is far from a single collector state. We have the state and we have 62 local collectors. Um, and yeah, I know there are 64 parishes, but Cameron doesn't have sales tax. So while there are multiple issues from that front, one of the recommendations from the task force is to develop a model that allows for uniformity of administration, uniformity of collection, so that in the event the Marketplace Fairness Act does pass, that we are ready to take advantage of that provision and collect sales tax from online vendors. There's also another commission that's been focused on this issue. It's the Sales Tax Streamlining and Modernization Commission is chaired by Representative Julie Stokes. They have actually gone through every exemption in the sales tax laws, and they've been going through all the administrative provisions in hopes of having a draft bill that will be introduced during the regular session that will include all of the provisions that we're talking about. The last thing I want to talk about before taking questions is the corporate income tax and then property tax. On the corporate side, the tax force, of course, endorsed the constitutional amendment that was before the voters on November 8th. And I expect that when our updated report comes out, you'll see another recommendation to continue moving towards the elimination of the federal income tax deduction on the corporate side. We're also recommending a phase out repeal or revamping of the corporate franchise tax. We think those are critical to ensuring that Louisiana remains a great place to do business. The property tax is a tax that is collected by local government, but it has become the subject of much discussion at the state level in recent years because of the inventory tax credit. Businesses pay tax on inventory at the local level, and the state gives them 100% credit when they file their income tax return. 
The current projections are for that credit to cost the state $500 million in FY17. That is a significant portion of the budget, and we need to come up with a way to eliminate that tax credit at the state level and for businesses to come up with an alternative to the inventory tax. There are other states that impose inventory taxes, primarily in the southeast, but nationally, inventory is not something that is taxed. There is a belief that it is a tax on a tax because ultimately that inventory is going to get sold to a consumer or going to become a part of the final product that's sold to a consumer. So the task force has a recommendation to phase out the inventory tax over 10 years and to phase out that inventory tax credit over a five year period. We will see, we've heard feedback that the 10 years and the five years are too far apart. We need to combine those to get to a shorter period of time. But what will happen with that remains to be seen, but that is our recommendation. The inventory tax should be changed. In addition, the industrial tax exemption program that has been the subject of recent changes by Governor's, Governor Edwards' executive order, we're recommending that those changes be put in the Constitution to allow local approval of the industrial tax exemption and to set standards for how those industrial tax exemption program contracts get approved. I think that covers the majority of our recommendations and I will take questions from the floor. No questions, Parker. <laughs> Can I see that uh, the recommendations include finding a way to lessen the tax burden in a way on corporate, yet we know that historically over the past several years, corporate has not been paying an equivalent share. You're talking about 33% of the <laughs> revenue from sales tax individual and corporate and and how do we make it it seems that we want to guarantee business profits and not worry so much about what people the individuals are having to pay in a actually Sue the corporate income tax is very volatile on a national level it's not just in Louisiana <laughs> and we've seen the changes in the corporate income tax because it it's based upon whether a business is profitable or not profitable, whether they have a loss for that year or not. So what we're looking at from the corporate side is also eliminating that federal income tax deduction so that your base is broader, so that more of the taxes are coming into the state, but also recognizing that we've made significant changes to the corporate income tax during 2016. We've enacted an add back provision, which is designed to ensure that the shifting of income across state lines to states with lower rates for those multinational companies goes away. Market-based sourcing so that we source income to Louisiana based upon the market that's developed here. And going to a single sales factor so that we focus on the fact that more businesses are focused on services and service-based industries. So we've made significant changes to the corporate income tax in hopes that we see the corporate income tax revenues growing as opposed to decreasing in the future years. As a follow-up though, don't those expire in 2018? No, these are permanent changes that were made. They do not expire in 2018. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about the refinery tax idea and how that might fit into this whole tax reform So the refinery tax is actually a proposal recommended by Representative Kenny Havert, who's the chair of the Transportation Committee in the House. It has come out of the Transportation Infrastructure Task Force, and what it's looking at is a tax on the refined products that are produced here in Louisiana. <coughs> this is an alternative recommendation to continuing or increasing the gasoline tax. How it will play with the rest of the revenue proposals we're working through right now, but that is the idea behind it. Yes. <coughs> You mentioned a moment ago you felt like the failure to pass the, the constitutional amendment on, on, on the corporate elimination of the federal income tax was due to a lack of education uh, and said that there would be enhanced efforts on that part. 
would you comment? Julie Stokes came before the press club, and she, to her credit, she gave a very detailed presentation of exactly the impact of the elimination of the corporate of the personal federal taxes and lowering of the rates. I put it out as a conservative blogger. I know numbers of, of others do did. So could you comment on perhaps they were educated, and it, that's the reason it didn't get through the legislature, and the, even the corporate version failed when it went before the voters, that maybe they do, maybe they did get educated. It is quite possible that the voters were very well educated about the constitutional amendment and made a decision that the corporate federal deductibility was something that they wanted to keep in place. Mm -hmm. It's From the tax force perspective, we didn't see a lot of coverage on the constitutional amendment and explaining what it would and would not do. So that is our reasoning that we think that better education of what the changes are from a corporate income tax and individual income tax perspective would be. And also having a tool available that voters can go in, plug their information in and see exactly what the impact of the proposed changes would be on their individual income tax. So those are some things that we've worked on developing. Expect that that website that allows voters to go in and look at their own tax situation will be up and running after the first of the year so that we really can start this conversation. Well, could I have a quick follow-up? I assume the website would basically produce results where she broke it down by bracket, and it clearly shows a pretty substantial increase in the benefit in the burden going from those making about 100 to 200 thousand a year, and shows negative brackets for amounts from zero to 50 thousand. Uh, and I assume that even though you put the bracket, you would put the income in for your own situation. I would figure that it's going to produce these types of results. How would how, how would uh, you then try to sell it to those that are in those particular brackets, but from 100 to 200 thousand, that it is shifting a significant tax burden onto them and generating an overall net increase of 18 million dollars, according to the, the figures that she gave us. Well, I think the document that you're referring to is one that Representative Stokes developed based upon <coughs> a proposal that she put forward. It is not the exact same recommendation that we're making, and okay. working to make sure that the impact across income levels. Is not extreme is something that we're hoping to do with this proposed change. All right, thank you. Yes. So we did, uh, oh, repeat the question. question. Uh, it was, I forgot. Uh, you mentioned uh, in the presentation about uh, modernizing our sales tax collections. And I know that there was some discussion after the legislature passed the uh, Amazon law in the last session that uh, may not be constitutional or may be a way to circumvent the uh, marketplace. Uh, on the way in, I just heard that uh, Amazon's now going to start the sales tax in Louisiana. Um, how do, does that affect the, um, the, uh, the Amazon law that we passed that sort of negated this question about whether it's a law or not? And how is that going to affect sales tax? So see, that's why I haven't repeated the question <laughs> three minutes long. Okay. okay, so the question was on the Amazon law that was passed during the regular session whether it was constitutional or not, and that Amazon has recently announced that they will be collecting sales tax in Louisiana. So let me give you multiple parts to the question. On the law that was passed earlier this year, it was modeled after a provision that was enacted in Colorado. The Court of Appeals, Federal Court of Appeals, upheld the Colorado Act, which is the reason we were following that. The Supreme Court denied writs last week on the Colorado appeal. So for purposes of existing law, the requirement that an online company has to submit a list of all their customers to the State Department of Revenue has been upheld. Amazon has agreed to voluntarily collect taxes here in Louisiana. I think that announcement came out today. And we look forward to working with Amazon going forward. But Amazon, while they are considered one of the largest online companies, they're not the only one. So we do have some additional companies that we're hoping to get registered. And if not those companies registered, then federal provisions that would require those companies to register and collect sales tax. Yes. Is the inability to correct our budget situation and an inability to predict our revenue or inability of our legislature to accept the problem. 
The question is whether our budget situation is the result of an inability to predict revenues or an inability of our legislature to accept that there's a problem. I think that our current budget situation is the result of many years of changes to the tax structure that we created incentives. We also eliminated some of the changes that were enacted under the Stelly plan, but we only eliminated those on the income tax side. We left the deductions in the Constitution in place saying that certain items weren't subject to sales tax. That created a certain balance in our revenue raising. With that imbalance, as opposed to addressing the imbalance, we continue to look for other means to fund state services through non-recurring revenue, the use of one-time dollars, and all of those have kind of caught up with us. We need a broad-based approach to addressing the, the fiscal structure of the state, recognizing that we do have to raise some revenue. There have been significant cuts made across state government, and if there are more cuts to be made, we need to decide which programs are going to be eliminated, because there's simply not enough in terms of fat to cut. Is it an inability to predict revenue or an inability of legislature to accept the problem? Can we predict our revenue? There's two questions. Is the problem an inability to predict revenue or an inability of the legislature to accept our problem? I can't say that all members of the legislature have not accepted our problem. I think that as we continue to have deficit after deficit and we continue to look forward, there have to be tough decisions made. And part of our problem has been predicting revenue. We've had revenues that were predicted to come in lower than they were actually coming in, I'm sorry, expenditures. So you have to accurately determine what the expenditures are going to be. And then once you determine those, you have to know the amount of revenue that's coming in alongside it. We thought we raised at least part of the revenue necessary for this coming year. But one of the issues is, according to the economists that make the recommendations, we're currently in a recession in Louisiana. And that recession is having an impact on the amount of revenue coming in. So it's a, there are multiple reasons that we have this issue. It's not so easy to lay blame simply at one place. There are another question. Yes. Um, I'm having so much fun today. Yeah, uh, 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 we're enjoying ourselves. Thank you. Uh, but, um, with the uh, 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 President-elect Trump, who may, may be actually President-elect uh, as of today, uh, has suggested uh, sharp cuts in, in uh, higher <coughs> earners income taxes. What We have not decoupled state income tax from federal tax in, in the ways that you've described. What is the, what is the short-term impact uh, if there were to be tax, significant tax cuts in the new Congress? So the question is, what would be the short-term impact in Louisiana if there were to be tax cuts in the new Congress? Because we have not decoupled ourselves from federal tax changes as it relates to the federal income tax deduction, as those taxes decrease at the federal level, you lose some of the benefit of your deduction, so you would end up paying more in state taxes because you'd have a smaller deduction from your adjusted gross income. So for some of those higher earners, you will see an increase in the amount of state taxes that are paid. Um, during the winter, session, the session, the portion of bonded indebtedness payments to balance the budget. And one of the things that the task force recommended was going through and looking at all of those dedications. Let's determine if that amount of revenue needs to be dedicated. What you heard from the administration and from the Senate with regard to that proposal when it was introduced is that you can't simply take money that's 
going to pay down bonded indebtedness and shift it somewhere else in the budget. That there are reasons that we structured our revenue stream in the way that we have and that we need to continue in that manner. The task force didn't make a recommendation on doing that, but we did make a recommendation on evaluating all of those different dedications and determining if they're all still priorities. Yes. You mentioned that stability was one of the goals of the program. Yes. Was there any consideration given to making these recommendations of the program lobbyist proof for a period of time? The question is whether there was any consideration given to making these proposals lobbyist proof for a period of time. I'm not sure how we would make these proposals lobbyist proof other than banning lobbyists from the legislative process. So um, I know that there are lobbyists on both sides, some that want to recommend a lot of the same things that the task force is recommending, some that think that we should go even further on our recommendations, and some that will be protecting certain interests to ensure that some exemptions stay in place and that our base not be as broad as the task force is recommending. All voices need to be at the table and be heard. So we're unfortunately not going to be able to make this lobbyist proof. Yes. Forgive me if you alluded to this, but is will there be a focus not just from the task force but otherwise towards a gasoline tax? And if so, would you contradict or would you concur with Senator Vitter's commentary in the campaign last year that only 11 cents out of every dollar makes its way to bridges? and roads, the other 89 cents is spent on administration. I believe even reference state police had braided the trust fund to, to help fund a pay raise. So is there going to be a focus on a gasoline tax? And if so, how can you, how does the administration plan to provide assurance that there won't be further raids of the nature he alluded to? So the question is on the gasoline tax and whether there will be a proposal to change the gasoline tax and how we ensure that the administrative cost with the current transportation trust fund are lowered. Yes. Okay. The HCR 11 task force deferred the transportation infrastructure piece to the governor's task force established to focus on infrastructure. Um, that task force met for the last five months, went through all of the issues surrounding transportation and went around the state and heard from stakeholders around the state the 89% figure that you quoted is not an accurate figure for the administrative cost associated with the current transportation infrastructure planning and delivery system. What the Secretary of DOTD, who I think was here a few weeks ago, probably went in a great deal giving you the information on what their current administrative percentages are, but the 89% is far higher than it actually is. It's a much lower number. And from the governor's perspective, he heard the citizens. And so you will find that state police is not a part of the transportation funding anymore. They are no longer receiving those dollars. The governor believes and has made sure that we are only using transportation dollars to fund transportation, that we're not using it in other areas of the budget. So, so Senator Vitter was flat out inaccurate when he said those? I can't speak to whether Senator Vitter was flat out inaccurate. I typically don't quote Senator Vitter, so. <laughs> Very good. Uh, the, uh, I understand that you have, you have talked to uh, uh, groups at, at both the lobby and at, uh, the, at the technical lobby uh, group, uh, publicly and privately in, in different, what, different times. What is the reaction of the business lobby in general to the is it negative? Is it ultra cautious? Is it more positive than, than I think it might be? The question is what has been the reaction of the business community to the proposals that we've set forth? I think that they have been cautious, cautiously optimistic. There are some changes that we are recommending that they support um, and things that they are interested in seeing further developed. So we're having this dialogue with them on some of the proposed changes. I was at Lobby last week. I've been to the Chemical Association and um, I've started speaking at regional economic development organizations around the state. And so far the feedback has been positive that we're making recommendations that are broad based. They've looked and compared 
our recommendations to those from the Tax Foundation and see that we're on the same page in a lot of areas. They've also looked at the fact that the state continues to have a budget deficit and so they want to know what needs to be done. Is it simply that we need to raise more revenue or do we need to look holistically at all of the state services that we're providing? But thus far, they've been cautiously optimistic. So the question is, what have I enjoyed about the job so far? And what are the lessons learned for going into the new year? Um, I think the, the best thing about the job so far has been being back at the department and the dedicated employees who are there. Um, there are people at the department who have been there for 30 plus years. They are very knowledgeable. They are great servants. They come in every day willing to give 110%. And so they are an inspiration. That's been one of the best things about the job, including the one who's sitting over there, Byron Henderson, who does the job of three people, because our public information division is only Byron Henderson. But he does a great job every day. And so that's been the best part of the job, working with professionals like Byron Henderson. Um, lessons learned for next year. Get more tennis shoes. <laughs> And hopefully we don't have um, multiple special sessions. I'd like to just start the regular session in April. But definitely making sure that we provide the information up front so everyone knows the details, the information that we are sharing, and they're ready to start the discussions. Yes, sir. We had a major flood basically a few months ago. I'm sure the state spent quite a bit of money what basically we're expecting significant funds from the federal government in addition to the board made. How does that impact our projected budget for this year? So the question is on the flooding and the funds that we're expecting from the federal government and how that will impact our budget for this year. What we are anticipating, we've had some lessons learned on the receipt of federal dollars after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita and Ike and Gustav. While we're expecting additional federal dollars, what we expect is that we will see that revenue start to impact the economy in the future. But in the short term, we have seen some growth in sales tax as a result of the flooding. People are having to replace things. As that money moves into the economy, we expect to see a small increase in tax dollars, more people going to work, in the construction industry, purchases of those construction supplies. We're expecting to see that, but we are moderating what that level of growth will be. We don't expect to have the same Katrina effect. Does the 480 million go directly to the people? No, the, the question is whether the 480 million goes directly to the people. The 480 million goes through the federal housing agency and through community development block grant funding. The Restore Task Force is making recommendations on the proposals for how that 480 will be used. But it does not go directly into the hands of individuals. It goes into the programs that are developed and then will be utilized to provide housing assistance to individuals that were impacted by the flood. And I think. Quick question. Quick question. These questions are never quick. <laughs> How critical do you feel the renewal of the penny sales tax is or isn't with the proposed plan? And what backup plan would there be if the legislature should not uh, renew the one cent sales tax that expires in uh, eight, nine, 18 months? So the question is how critical is the renewal of the penny sales tax? The recommendations from the task force do not include a renewal of that one cent sales tax. The recommendations are to broaden the base, to expand beyond the current services that are taxed and to lower the sales tax rate from five to four. So that is our focus. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for having me.